Manchester. If I was to suddenly call out, ring the police now, and say there's a terrorist bomb going to go off, they'd probably come and they'd lock me up. But the media did this at Old Trafford in April 2004. Complete hoax. And it was a hoax. And people, the length and breadth of the country, were alerted to it through the media forums. But it was all a deliberate hoax. And when it was found out to be a hoax, there was no apology. It was all a shush. Police, media, complicit. All coming from this fair city. Or track record in terrorism, bear in mind I got thrown out because of my assignment was a terrorist threat assessment, or that was the stance I made, when I refused to say that the main threat to the United Kingdom comes from Islamic extremism. When 9-11-7-7 were not committed by 23 Muslim maniacs um, and I just stood my ground but our track record in British police it is deplorable Absolutely. and when we do get found out any apology when we're found out when the politician is done begrudgingly coming from South Yorkshire I uh, I was in Sheffield at the time of the miner strike and all of a sudden, nearly, well, eight, yeah, how many years since 1984, what we have is disclosures and corruption of South Yorkshire Police right, over the miners' affair. And this, in the same six weeks that we've had all the disclosure on Hillsborough, Hillsborough 
after 23 years of lies. And also, massive cover-up of child abuse issues, both in Rotherham and Sheffield, that have now proven to be hidden by my former police force. And I'm ashamed to say, my former boss, the director of intelligence, was, it was on his watch, the head of public protection. Hillsborough. I want to say a few words about this, because... Um, The more I think about Hillsborough, the more I actually believe, quite frankly, that this was, and I hate to say this, a deliberate sacrifice. <laughs> this was a disaster waiting to happen for two successive years. There were many things that were wrong and evil that, that happened. There were serious misprints. There was obviously serious cover-up, and we don't, I don't need to go into that. But there was also some very sinister happenings that went on prior to the allocation of who would take command and control of this. There was very much a satanic ritual that was carried out by the, 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 this, the command of the uh, operational commander that was scheduled, Chief Superintendent Brian Moore, whereby a probation officer was called to an emergency meeting at a cemetery to be greeted by hooded Balaclava people that had dug a grave in the ground of the cemetery and were burying this probation officer alive. Just before, just before, they covered his head completely so he couldn't breathe. Off came the Balaclavas. Three officers Pulled the balaclavas off. These were his working colleagues. This was a this was a ritual that they were putting him through. That officer never returned to work ever again. Completely freaked out. His father took the case to the Independent Police Complaints Commission when he got no joy from South Yorkshire Police, and that then was covered up. The only thing that happened was the chief superintendent that was used to patrolling Hillsborough. In the two previous semi-finals where this disaster was waiting to happen, was swiftly removed from that particular task from the day of Hillsborough. Now, why who Queen Belmo on the football? Why do I, why, why do I raise the possibility of it being such an evil act? Notwithstanding the cover-up that we've had. Well, Qui Bono, while there's a hundred people listening to this talk and what we've had this afternoon. In Manchester, there's millions watching football or glued to the TV, which is exactly way, the way they want it. And when you look at what happened post Hillsborough, the ground improvements that came in and the creation of the Premiership, the massive, the billions that were poured into it, would never have happened had it not been for the Millsborough disaster, Hillsborough disaster, well, it certainly would have happened quite so soon. And the whole emphasis of Lord Justice Taylor's report was ground improvement, rather than allocating responsibility for the misdeeds of the day. And even today, 23 years, or 23, 24 years, or even after Lord Justice Stuart Smith and the recent Bishop of Liverpool and his independent panel inquiry, um, we still haven't had the full story. There are still incidences um, where police reputations have been covered up and remain so without any kind of murmur of them from the police and our, our admission. Other false flags, other evil deeds that we've actually conveniently blamed on others. And we go into the last decade, the racing plot that never was, that happened just a year before the old traffic bomb holes. We've mentioned, David mentioned, um, people who were whacked, David Kelly amongst them. He mentioned, sir, uh, we mentioned Robin Cook. Have we mentioned Michael Todd, your former chief police constable? Chief constable? Was he whacked too? His portfolio was the counter-terrorism portfolio. 
who was making noises about the renditions in Guantanamo Bay considered the possibility that he was whacked too. Where did he die at the exact same location? But a crime is not quickly dealt with. The populace start to commit acts of wrongdoing readily. And when we've got an American situation where 9-11 is still not generally accepted by any of all parliamentarians as an inside job, only one perhaps has had the brass to stand up and even now he's quite lost his courage. Little wonder that we're spiralling with massive corruption throughout the judicial, the political and the law enforcement arena. The lies behind the walls, based on a false, exaggerated terror threat that takes us to what ultimately cost me my job. Because the final straw for me was when I simply had no reason to believe the government narrative on 7-7. And if that government narrative had been truthful, it would have been quite easy for the government to allay all concerns that one might have. It struck into the heart of the counter-terrorism strategy, the rich picture, the rich picture. The rich picture that was basically demonizing Muslims, that was spying on Muslims, that was creating in the British public of great fear, all heightened, all exaggerated, deliberately so. And on the 22nd of July 2005, we had the horrific incident whereby John Charles de Benzes, an innocent Brazilian, was followed down the escalator and was shot in the head three, seven times. And our police service sought to cover all that up, just like they did with the London bombings. And there's three things really I want to, you know, that I want to come from my talk today. Is that an understanding of the forces that have shaped the events of the last hundred years, and certainly the last decade of the police force, is predicated not so much on the lessons to be learned, but on the secrets to be discovered. What is binding everything together here is the secret societies. And that men and women become accomplices to the evil they fail to oppose. Say that again. Men and women become accomplices to the evil that they fail to oppose. <laughs> the price that men and women pay for their apathy and indifference towards public affairs is that they are ruled by evil men. That is what we have at the moment. We are ruled by evil men. And women. And women. <coughs> the terrorism act, the counter-terrorism strategy, they called it rich picture. Or one out of it, the four strands. And I, what I wanted to discuss, since I've been out, I've um, encountered quite a lot of people who've given me information about uh, what their thoughts are and what their experiences on the London bombings, which in a way was um, timed in 2005 at Tony Blair's lowest ebb, where protests were widespread on the streets about the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And what we have with the London bombings is a thousand and one reasons why the government narrative is incorrect. We have, in British justice, we've never had a trial to establish who was guilty. They told us, in the late Justice Hallett inquiry, that there were no post-mortems. And yet, there were postmortems. 
I have from a very reliable source the very fact that they were post mortems because he was dealing with them. But that came out in 2010. And why would they have to try and hide the fact that they were post mortems? It's because the injuries sustained by the fatality were not consistent with the narrative that was put forward that these were suicide bombers. So they had to bury that particular site, insight. Now what I wanted to show you is a quite remarkable case. Does anybody here think that four Islamic terrorists blew themselves up on 7th of July 2005? I do. There is one. There is always one. <laughs> I don't know whether anyone will have... Uh, can, can anybody put their hand up if they're familiar with the case of Seven versus Gossage and nine others? Good. You're not familiar with it. This is quite a remarkable case. It's been ongoing since 2003. It gives potential insight into what really happened in London bombings, the likes of which few will be aware of. I want to share a little bit of that case with you. Charles Seven, bottom left, bottom right, Sorry, bottom left, isn't it? Yeah. In 2003, she took a, she, she had a multimedia platform that she wanted patented. She went to her solicitors, and then within a very short period of time, she was subjected to massive intellectual property theft and concealment of all of that that went on. With now, what we're talking about by terms of her medium platform. Well, you'll all be aware, if you watch TV, of programmes like Celebrity on Ice and Celebrity Come Dancing and the likes. These were the ideas that she had, that she took to the solicitors to be patented. Before she knew it, they were whisked away from her. And she saw all this, um, and she tried to do something about it when she was betrayed by her own solicitors for her. So, the brave lass took the establishment on, took the multimedia industry on, took it through the courts. That started in late 2003. In the run-up to the London bombing in 2005, she was scheduled to be in the Royal Court of Justice with a case of Seven versus Gossage and nine others. The Gossage refers to Christopher Gossage. The nine others refers to Russell's law firm, specialist in intellectual property theft. Richard Hanna, NTL, that then became Virgin Media. Helen Mary Alexandra, Jim Hansen, Manson, sorry, who then had been a TV producer and Scottish media group. Tamsin Allen, who's currently residing on the Leveson Inquiry from Bynum's solicitors. Derek Rosenblatt and Christopher Vaughan from Cyprus. What's so special about this case was that for five, six years she was obstructed but she wouldn't lay down. She kept she took it single-handedly. Uh, a family of a legal background. So, Miss Seven, Charles Seven, trained herself up in law, and actually, to get to the end point first, in 2006, in front of the late Nicholas Pumphrey, middle top, she produced her case, and for a three-day hearing, the judge ruled that this case would have to go to a criminal trial, and that there was no way that this wasn't going to happen, despite the protestations and all sorts of skullduggery that had happened beforehand 
in the lead up to 2006 when we had this hearing. We're talking scullery of the highest order, we're talking the defence barrister of uh, many of these defendants, the Gossage and nine others, Brian Nicholson, was perpetrating all sorts of scullery in the courtroom, trying to derail the whole system. But the perseverance of seven got us the case, and Judge Pumphrey awarded in front of her the costs and proceeding towards a criminal trial. He said verbally that this was the best case litigant in person that he'd ever seen in his life. And that just because the reputations of major companies that I've already mentioned was no good reason to throw the case out. What subsequently transpired after that three day hearing was quite astonishing because no court order ever materialised and that the case, to all intents and purposes, was tried to be again, not for the first time, derailed. And that a fraudulent order, cobbled together by Brian Nicholson, appeared that in effect closed down the case. Now the case would have been dead and buried, were it not for the persistence of Miss Seven. Because she tried to get the transcripts of the three-day hearing. She was told by the Court of Appeal administration staff that they would be corrupt. So she said, well, in, and she would have to be charged £3,000 for the privilege. Instead, she said, I'll have the audio tapes of the three-day hearing. Now, not all judges are corrupt. And that just before she made that request, she discovered that the late Nicholas Pumphrey died unexpectedly on the 24th of December, 2007. So she required the audio tapes from the Judge Warren. And the audio tapes, when they came back, were very authentic and an accurate and reliable representation of the three-day hearing. I've listened to those audio tapes. I've listened, I've, 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 I've read the files from beginning to end. And it is absolutely impossible to reconcile what was on the audio tapes uttered blasted out, in many cases, by Judge Humphrey, against Brian Nicholson, where none of the defendants turned up other than Brian Nicholson. And that there was only one direction this was ever going to go in, if, and I put in accordance to the audio tapes. So, what subsequently happened, a rehearing in front of Lord Lawrence Justice, uh, Lord Justice Lawrence Collins was heard in 2008. The audio tapes had been released and that this was going to offer incriminating evidence that was going to prove that um, Charles Seven had a criminal case against these 10 organisations and individuals. And that this would link into very much what Seven was saying, and Charles Seven was saying, prior to the London bombings. Because this, since 2003, this lady had been gangstalked by these multimedia roles and other individuals, and fixers from the Metropolitan Police. It is a case of chronic vic repeat victimisation, the likes of which I've never seen in 17 years combined. What subsequently happened, Lord Justice Lawrence Collins, in a full court, completely closed the case down and indicated that these audio tapes are never to be heard in a British court again. Much to the outrage of those in the audience who went straight to the police to complain. But it has been successfully covered up today. Although, this lady will not lie down. 
I am persuaded 100% that she has been a victim and of massive court corruption and an abject failure by the Metropolitan Police to protect lives, to protect her as a crime of victimisation, to, to investigate crimes. The crimes she's been subjected to are many and varied. At a simple level, repeat victim of burglary, whereby in her apartment, the, over the course of the uh, last few years, she's had the apartment broken into to steal the audio, the very incriminating audio tapes and nothing else. The number of burglaries are in double figures at her apartment. The number of death threats she's had and reported to the police. She herself went to the police, alerting the Metropolitan Police prior to the London bombings that something terrible was going to happen in the underground in July 2005. Why did she have that insight? She had that insight because the very media moguls that had scanned her intellectual property rights from her were actually advertising almost in plain sight that something dreadful was going to happen in the legal at the time when the gang stalking was at its most intensive. She could see these exhibits in the media industry in time out. Now, whether she was justified in that kind of inference, it is an unmistakable fact that she went to the Metropolitan Police on numerous occasions in the months leading up to Linda Bonnings and saying, look, something terrible is going to happen. They're advertising it in plain sight. Programs were coming out. The hustle. Look at those train carriage numbers. They're all identical with one reference number. The reference number is my case number in the Royal Court of Justice. There were many other things that gave a reason to reasonable cause to suspect that something was going to happen. Now, understandably, perhaps, the police were a bit reluctant to, 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 to take those kind of inferences and do anything about it. You know, think of their position before London bombings. But even then, when it happened, she then had, with, with the benefit of hindsight, was able to strengthen her reasons for saying that certainly the people, the organisations involved in scamming her stuff, her intellectual property theft, my, is my mic still working? Were the very people that had prior knowledge that something dreadful was going to happen with the London bombings. I want to name this guy. The Glasgow Airport attack in 2007, April. Jim Manson, big TV producer, linked to Scottish TV. You need to have a look at this audio tape because he's one of the ten that was named in, in, in scamming her intellectual property rights, who started this massive gang stalking campaign against her. Why is he the one witness on the spot that? looks at the terrorist attack. Right? No other witness ever came forward for that. Was it all stage managed by all media? Google it, watch it, see if it's telling the truth. I want to just quickly go back to that photograph because she's there on the 1st of May 2012 the anniversary of the Unimilati outside in Holborn, outside the Independent Police Complaints Commission, where there's a mass protest that was led by Michael Doherty. I myself was there at the bottom right. That's when I met Seven for the first time. She told me a story. We didn't meet up, until, or I didn't contact her until the 17th of May 2012. I texted her on that day, two or three, just 16 days later. She couldn't speak to me because that particular day, two of her closest friends who'd supported her throughout the duration had died in unexpected circumstances independently. One was 54 and the other was 60. 
Both had nothing wrong with them in the lead up to their deaths. Now, what is the probability that they will lack, given that they were now creating nuisances of themselves to the agents of the state on something that was a billion pound industry and also something that potentially linked to those who had prior knowledge of the love of bombings and could start to destroy the government narrative. Well, no, I did another truth there. He's made films, compelling films, on the love of bombings. But he was in prison for 151 days to shut him up. And that coincided with the lady, just this Hallett's inquiry. When he came to defence of innocent Muslims, they had to throw him in prison because it was such a danger. Increasingly, we see perverse things happening within the police force. We have a camp, we have a student, a PhD student, Rizwan Sabir, at Nottingham University, studying for counter-terrorism for a PhD, downloading at the university open source information. Information from the CIA that we can get open source, I you anybody in this room can get it. He's doing a PhD. He's got every reason to do, to download this kind of information in order to do justice to a PhD. But the police came in and arrested him and shut him in prison for seven or eight days. And also his mentor. His professor, Rod Thompson came to the defence of these students and was appalled by the heavy-handed police tactics. But he was made a pariah in his own university just for coming to the defence and speaking truth to power in much the same way as I found myself getting chucked out of South York's police the moment I decided to speak truth to power. Is it a crime to go paintballing? Mohammed Hamid, father of Yasmin Kass. He was a bit of a lad in London. He was exposing the Freemasons. So what did, how did he do it? Well, the BBC said, sponsored him on a paintball exercise up in the Lake District, where they filmed him. Said a few loose things, as anybody might do when they're pulling over and chewing the cud on the rights and wrongs of the world. And they used that as evidence that he was actually a terrorist and have slammed him in the prison. The media publicity helps cover it all up. If you've not seen this program, I think you need to, the Generation Jihad. It's all on YouTube, but it's putrid. And they got, who did they get? The star of British policing. policing. None other than Norman Betterson. <laughs> so Norman Bethesda talked about, in terms of the, the threat to terrorism, he talked in terms of an infection, an infection that would require 20 years of treatment. He is the infection. The infection is ACPO, the Association of Chief Police Officers. They need the 20 years of treatment. As a principal intelligence analyst, how did they brainwash me for 17 years? How could that be? Well, I just want to show you, talk you through one or two of the techniques. How they pigeonhole thought processes. And this was all belly and sound. At the time of the London bomb, at the time of my dismissal, the Metropolitan Police were on a big advertising campaign where posters were being put in out to encourage everybody to be diligent and look out for any signs of terrorist activity. Right? You wouldn't have to travel far in London to come across a poster like this. It got ridiculous at this time because the police were writing the length and breadth of the country to organisations in order to get the organisations to think, to, to do a self-assessment of how they were exposed to a terrorist attack, 
and what they might do to prevent it. And yet, the, the statistical probability of a terrorist attack in any organisation that they were sending letters to was so remote, it was ridiculous. But this was the brainwashing technique that they were using in the counter-terrorism strategy known as contest. With the, out, with the four stands being pursued, prevent, protect and prepare. The main one was prevent to stop people becoming terrorists and supporting terrorists. That was the early one. That was the pre... The, that predated the contest strategy. And the same risk assessment processes, the rich picture that they were gathering, was, per, was per, being permeated to all sorts of public sector. The secret family calls, the risk assessments, were all coming in and the rich picture was about gathering information on targeted groups. And in this instance, the targeted group was Muslims, Muslims in mosques, Muslims at universities. We needed to contact, get intelligence on those things. What intelligence did we get? Anything that deviates from the norm was the answer from special branch. Anything that deviates, well, what is normal? I don't know. Anything that deviates from the norm. But let's count it. Performance indicators were brought in. How many intelligence logs have we got on the Muslims? As part of the Rich Picture Initiative, we count the damn things. And it was good performance, the more the merrier. Irrespective of the quality of the intelligence that we weren't really cited on. This was Kafkaesque. This was Orwellian. And what I had to go on as a principal intelligence analyst was, that, was my special branch analyst giving me sanitised reports that would regurgitate the, the, the threat levels that were being uttered by the Joint Terrorist Analysis Centre, which invariably was at critical or severe without any shred of intelligence to back it up. And we were after it. Swallow the lie. And the history was always, as I say, severe, critical. But then, the old, where did the Orwellian type kick in? Well, everything was in percentages, meaningless. My first degree was statistics. I'd had a break for two years in the Home Office and came back to the South Yorkshire Police. And as a principal intelligence analyst, we networked with others and we had conferences with principal intelligence analysts. And I saw 42 other principal intelligence analysts holding high threat assessment matrices, single pages that painted a picture of all the criminality in their area, all by numbers, all colour coded, all in percentages. I couldn't, as a statistician, I, for love of money, I couldn't understand why they were all getting so excited. But they were getting praised by the managers for producing colourful charts that looked good on a page in a glossy document. And they had the effect, the minimalist approach had the effect that the, the, the officers didn't have to read anything other than look at what was read and actually well, do something about that. This was the mentality that was creeping in. Based on very simplified, crude, invalid, unreliable statistical models. And what we were asked to do is look at, look, imagine some in, in some potential of a terror attack in your own backyard, what's the likelihood and what was the potential impact? Well, without any intelligence, it's how far can the imagination stretch? But invariably, the weighting of the models that I was seeing, perpetrated by principal intelligence analysts, was always skewed to give resources towards unaccountable areas like special branch or by trickery in numbers, or to promote an exaggerated fear of crime and threat. A typical matrix comes from, the, and this, this wasn't just in the police, the, the, the partnerships, local authorities were picking up the same practice. And what they would do, without blinding you with these amazing statistics, they produce tables and make meaningless comparisons without any explanation. But as long as they were covered 
and looked pretty. They kept Apple officers happy. We would compare the threat from terrorism against antisocial behaviour in a particular neighbourhood, let's say. It, it defied belief what we were being asked to do. For two years I protested and successfully opposed the introduction of a strategic threat assessment matrix in my own force. Quite happy to do a strategic assessment report, but I had no, I wanted nothing to do with this. In the end, they decided, rather than dying in a ditch, when the police authority got involved and said, we need something like this because HMIC mark it on the balance scorecard, and we don't want to be found wanting, do we? I decided I'd prostitute my own profession, being a statistician, and make the best of a bad job. But when I did wake up to the terror threat of 9 11 and 7 7, that's when I wouldn't have, you know, I had to make the stance that I did. They've got me booted out of the organisation. And all sorts of statistics were being collated from surveys that were sent out to the public. And they were being analysed by intelligence analysts who had no numeracy skills whatsoever. And these were being presented to a, a, a tasking and coordinating groups, typically chaired by um, a superintendent with neighbourhood inspectors. And analysts were feeding them with statistics about how much crime, how, how much we fear crime, how much we fear being burgled, expressed in terms of 66%. Well, last, last time it was 67%, so we've got to do better. That was, I kid you not, what I was seeing unfold within the national intelligence model tasking and coordinating processes. And that primary interest within a tasking and coordinating group, as all the problems of the district were passed around the table, was have you got any good news stories for each district so we can actually boost our reputation with the public. Truth went by the wayside. A desire to understand and appreciate the problems that the community were facing was sacrificed because individual officers wanted to look good in front of their superiors. This was the culture within the police. I've mentioned secret family courts. I'm going to end with this particular case study. Hands up, who recognises this lady? I don't know it is, but I Vicky Hay. Vicky Hay was a jump jockey. Uh, she, she, she raised horses over the six. She had a case. Her daughter, young daughter, was subject to child abuse. And when, when, when she was alerted to that child abuse, what happened was amazing because she took a case against her former partner. Now I have looked at the case files, I've looked at the engagement with the social service, and I've looked at the engagement with South Yorkshire Police, the public protection area. Actually, under the watch of my former boss, the Director of Intelligence. And for the life of me, I cannot understand the perverse and irrational decision that has taken place in this case. Because Vicky Hay, has suddenly just come out of prison, where she was sentenced for three years. What happened in this case is quite extraordinary. Because a daughter alleging that her partner was, child was abusing her. Vicky understandably wanted to protect her daughter. So first of all, there was a battle for custody. Vicky was loyal to actually allow a potential partner who was an alleged paedophile any further contact with Vicky. But as the case proceeded, Vicky's own legal team persuaded Vicky under immense pressure to actually drop the case for fear that if she was to pursue the case 
She will lose custody battle of her own daughter. So she was facing that terrible dilemma. Her own legal team were advising her to drop the case. And she did eventually, under great duress and pressure, drop her case and her allegations. But at no stage is the young daughter retracted. And what subsequently happened is that the moment that was done, her own defence team passed that message on to the judge, and the judge then made a verdict in a secret family court that Vicky was guilty of emotional abuse and subsequently coaching her daughter to lie. So she then was given a non molestation order. She couldn't have access to her home daughter. The, the, the father who the daughter still had made out, I didn't retract the allegations. The daughter was with the father. Vicky, a non molestation order. In the small town of Baltry, there then now came an incident where Vicky was caught, with her, saw her daughter at the garage floor court in a car while the father was filling up. What would a mother do in that situation? Well, she didn't, she, she didn't make a grab for her. She did actually approach them. And what subsequently happened is that that initially was uh, alleged to be an attempted kidnap, but was unproven. But nevertheless, it was a breach of the non molestation order. And for that breach, for that breach, Vicky, in a secret family court, was thrown into prison. Sentence three years. I repeat, I have looked at this case from beginning to end. I am absolutely ashamed of my former police force in Doncaster and the police officers that took the transcripts for such a perverse and irrational decision to come about. Why do I think? Well, I don't know, but it comes back to what I said at the beginning secrecy. Is there a protection racket here of Freemasons yes. that has covered all this up? Yes. Yes. There is no room for these secret family courts. More and more I'm seeing cases of child abuse where perverse decisions are, are occurring in, a, in social services where there's child snatching. And that child snatching is there to fuel the pockets of social services. And we stand by as a nation and we do very little effective in protesting. We do need to wake people up and it is about conscience and bravery and we all need to show courage in these desperate times. But we, we need to do it for our next generation. I don't know, we can all do what we can. I myself, having been thrown out, I've used Section 15, Article 3 of the Terrorism Act to refuse to pay my taxes. But then, in a desperate state, two or three months ago, in Birmingham, the thought crossed my mind that before I was aware of the Section 15, Article 3 of the Terrorism Act 2000, I had committed an offence under that act because I had reasonable cause to suspect back in 2010, that our country and my police force were involved in the concealment of terrorist activity. So, whilst I wasn't appreciative of Section 15, Article 3 of the Terrorist Act at that particular time, I did pay my council tax. I did pay a court fine when I lost the employment uh, uh, hearing. So I handed myself in for arrest at Birmingham, Digbeth Police Station, and quite an astonishing thing happened. Five police officers in three cars came to arrest me on a Sunday afternoon at five o'clock. And when they arrested me, not one of them knew of the act. And when I told them who I was, there were two, there was one that was Asian. He recognised me and he then congratulated me on my stance. What followed was quite remarkable because the four other police officers shook my hands and congratulated me also. But I was adamant that he should handcuff me and arrest me because I was guilty of committing an offence under Section 15, Article 3 of the Terrorism Act 2000. 
They didn't want to arrest me, but they did agree to take me to the police station. Taking me to the police station, they wanted to get the Westminster Counterterrorism Unit to give them a steer on what on earth to do with Tony Farrell, who was handing himself in for arrest. While we were waiting for a response to the Counterterrorism Unit, they asked for verification for who I was. They were trying to get hold of the South Yorkshire Police on the Sunday afternoon to no avail. So we took them in the back office and Googled quite a few of the documentaries and films about the London bombings and what's going on and about certain films like Collison and Farrell are dead that I've been involved with. These officers were blissfully unaware of what is out there on the internet. That's how brainwashed our officers are. They were grateful. And I suppose the moral of the little story here is that we need to help the police. Not all police will be bad. They need to wake up. On the 5th of December, November 2012, some of your guests would have been down at London um, at uh, the anonymous event where there might have been 2,000 people turned up, protested outside the House of Commons. I was talking to the police officers and the Metropolitan Police. I didn't have a mask on. They knew who I was. The intelligence that they'd been given about what was happening that evening was that these were simply computer hackers. That's what they genuinely thought. Morale in the Met, according to them, was, well, I asked them, and they said, you needn't ask, so tell me, it is terrible, it is rock bottom. So the police could be turned could be turned from bottom up. But we need to target the police to wake them up because they're masters at that poor level. If you've risen to that level, you've probably by that time sold your soul. Sold your soul so you're prepared to cover up 7-7 seven, seven, even when you're playing sighted, something is radically wrong. And when they fail to oppose that evil, then little wonder police officers down below start to perpetrate the same thing when they are complicit in child snatching that's going on in the secret family courts and we get all sorts of corruptions and they're really scared. So we've got to keep the pressure on, we've got to keep chipping away. I myself am committed to help child seven in her case and expose that. And if they want to back me, well, at least they can't make an excuse that it was something different. Because my best insurance policy with that respect is to actually make it known, which is what I fully intend to do. And I have a very detailed report that's just about to get released. So I don't want to be in a society, I don't want to be facing a police force that's totally corrupt from top to bottom. And it needs to heal itself. So I think we've all got a job. The police have got a key role in helping the nation. But I don't think we're going to transform them from ACPO level downwards. I think we need to wake the masses up. Because within the masses, they will have not yet sold the souls to the devil and join the secret societies and the secret oaths. And the commitment to a manager of enabling the one truth. And that was the manager that I, the putrid manager I was faced with. The very last thing I remember. My report was called A Rich Picture of a Noble Lie or Enabling the One Truth. That was what got me the sack. Enabling the One Truth. That said, do that was on my back when I heard that. What was it? Well, it came from ACPO, it came from the, the Chief Constable. And basically, the performance manager said to me, it means that if they say something is truthful, it is truthful. There is to be no dissent. I looked at the performance manager and said, the intelligence analyst function is dead and buried. Rest in peace. Not long after that, I was booted out of the organisation. I'm mighty glad I was. I'm far happier, far more at peace on this side than on that. But I am not against the police.
gifts per se, and they need working on. Okay, thank you.